from all right as as i've said before for anybody who wonder why i'm just now starting it i just think we should not uh publicize our prayer requests and our, our private prayers and our, our toils and all that for the world to hear and see that we should start recording after that so so welcome again to prayer meeting this is the book that we're doing surviving the shaking for those of you who cannot see and we are pretty much down the road in this book we're getting close to uh to the climax of it we're on chapter six we started it last week it's called waiting on a friend i love that title waiting on a friend uh, and tonight we'll talk about the source of our strength and i hope that it encourages you as it has encouraged me if uh, you can't hear me well or you just need to uh, let me know some just let me know because we want to make sure uh, that uh, this is a blessing and if we mute someone it's only because there's interference in your line if you want to talk uh, just just unmute we just want to make sure we get a clean uh, recording so let's pray again father thank you for uh, this wednesday night session thank you uh, for allowing us to join together and touch and agree on all of the prayer requests. We thank you for uh, the prayers that you have answered and given us reason to rejoice. And also, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do as we continue to dig in to justification, sanctification, and glorification. We ask, Lord, that uh, all of us as your people see the relevance of it and grasp on to what you're trying to say to us about our Christian walk. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, here we go. This is where we left off last week. We left off on this particular uh, page, page 63, paragraph three. And all we're gonna do is kind of overlap it a little bit and uh, begin where we end it so that we can go right into what is next. So I'll read this one, but I'm looking for somebody else to read after this slide. And remember tonight we're not going fast, so there's not a lot of slides. I want mostly discussion tonight uh, because of the subject matter. All right, so this is the last thing we read last week. Paul also taught this vital lesson to the Colossians. He told them that through justification, Christ would present them holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his God the Father's sight. If ye continue in the faith, trusting in Christ's justifying merits, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, glorification which ye have heard, Colossians 1, 22 and 23. Uh, so let me just set the table of, of give you the context of where we are now. Uh, in the beginning of this book, remember there was a story about Helen Keller and how uh, unfortunately she lost her sight and her hearing and her parents became frustrated trying to communicate with her, trying to discipline her uh, for her good. And as a result, Helen became frustrated and she began to act out because she did not understand uh, what they were trying to say to her. They had a issue with communication. And, uh, and so that story catapulted us into the purpose of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's God's form of communicating with us. When we don't get it correctly, we tend to act out. Lord have mercy. We tend to, <laughs> we tend to do things against each other. We tend to be too harsh with one another to judge and con convict and condemn one another because we have a communication problem. And so the teacher that comes into Helen's life is the person who shows her a way of communicating and it settles her. And once she gets the language down, Helen begins to flourish for the rest of her life. This is a metaphor for the Christian walk. 
Uh, if we are acting out, if we are frustrated, if we tend to look at each other more than we trust God, it means that we have a communication problem. And why am I going over this yet again? Because I want to give the context of what God is trying to accomplish through these readings that we're doing. Almost every issue we have in the church is because of a lack of faith in God. We may believe in him, we may love him, but when it comes time to uh, walk this walk together, we tend, to, we tend to try to do it our own way, and that's why we mess church up. But what if we turn to God and said, Lord, these are your children. I can't keep myself, let alone keep anybody else. Then I wonder what would happen. Would we become the church that Christ intends for us to be? All right, anybody ready to read for me? Anybody? If nobody else wants to, I will. Thank you, Brother Parker. You got it. Christ revealed the same truth to John the Revelator. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that first which thou hast, the promise of being justified in God's eyes through the merit of Christ's blood, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation 3, 11 and 12. Yes, sir. So here's the key. We tend to focus on behold, I come quickly, which is worthy of focusing on. But tonight the emphasis is hold that first which thou hast. Another way of, of saying that is our first love. All right, first discussion here. Is it difficult to hold on to our first love? our first joy that we have when we first come into a knowledge of Christ and the truth and how excited we were. Is it difficult to hold on to that? Anybody? I want to say no. All right. Thank you, Mike. Why do you say no? Because God, God always going to be there for us and we should always be there for him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Any anyone else? Uh, Sister Audrey, go right ahead. I would say yes, it would be, because as you mature and grow in life, things come into your life, people come into your life to kind of um take your mind off of your first love of what mm -hmm. you're doing. And so for me, yes, when I came in, I was on fire. I was 18 years old and wow, I just thought the world was whatever. <laughs> <And so then, laughs> but um, yes, not that it can't be renewed. It can be renewed, right. but I'm saying yes, in the beginning for me. All right. All right. Thank you, Sister Audrey. Sister Hood. Uh, I agree with Sister Audrey and would say yes in that, uh, uh, like she said, you come in and, you know, you when you've been out in the world and you've been beat up by the world and, you know, and you've experienced the world and figure out that the world has uh, a lot of heartache and pain and and evil and wickedness and hooking and crooking and all that. So to make it into the city of refuge, yes, that love, that desire, because I don't know about anybody else, but I wanted to experience Christ long before I really gave my heart to Christ because I didn't really understand the process or what, what, what that looked like, what was I supposed to do or how it was supposed to happen. And so coming into the house of the Lord, you know, my expectations were that it was going to be a beautiful, lovely, everybody was going to get along and we were going to sing Kumbaya and, you know, live happily ever after. And, um, you know, not realizing that 
the church is full of broken people too. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so who are trying to figure out, uh, work out their salvation as well. And so when I'm broken, trying to figure it out, and you're broken, trying to figure it out, we may rub each other, or I may see something that I wasn't expecting to see or experience. And, you know, it kind of like, okay, wait a minute, am I in the church or in the world of the world or the church? And so, uh, so, so yeah, those experiences can have a tendency to, to yes, kind of put a little damper on that fire because now I really have to develop that relationship in order to learn how to, to have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And so it's not until I be really begin to cultivate that relationship, which is through sanctification, because when I come in, I'm just justified, you know? And so I tend to agree with Sister Audrey, not that I can't get it back, but yes, there is a, a time where, yeah, that, that zeal, that fire can grow dim. All right, thank you, Sister Barbara Brooks. I think that's who has her hand up here. Is that you? That's Sister Brooks? Okay. Uh, Brother Parker. I agree totally. I will say yes also, because I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I looked around, everything looked totally different. I mean, the sky, the tree, everything <laughs> looked totally different. And that's the truth, because when I first gave my life to God, I remember walking out to church, looking up into the sky, and everything was beautiful. But then as you go through the process of sanctification, you began to come into the reality of things. You find out, like Sister Hood was just saying, things are not the way that you thought they were at first. You began to see people in the church as they really are. And you have to struggle to continue to walk in that sanctified life. And then you began to see reality and you know it's a struggle. It's not like people say, hey, once you accept Christ, everything gonna be all right. That's not so. That's when your troubles began and that's when your testing time began to turn you into the person Christ wants you to be. And yes, sometimes the first love does go away but you can recover it if you have a desire to. And that's why we have to hunger and thirst after righteousness, as the Bible says, and we will be filled. But yeah. the answer is yes. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Sister, Sister Gladys. Uh, I wanna say yes and no. I, I say, um, there's a song that used to be, I don't know who made the song, but it's a secular song called, You Have to Fan the Flame to keep it burning hot. All right. And with, with you have, when you first come into the truth and the knowledge about the Lord, you're just, oh my gosh, everything mm -hmm. is just so beautiful and you're on fire and you want everybody to feel the fire. You want everybody to know about the Lord. <laughs> Excuse me. It's just like cooking and putting a pot on the stove and it comes to a boiling point and then you turn the fire down to a simmer where it's a nice even cooking flame. You have to fan the flame by putting, by reading the word. The word will keep that relationship renewed. It's about a relationship. And I know I'm just jumping all over everywhere, but it's about a relationship. If you have a relationship, it's about having, being in love with your spouse. When you first fall in love, boy, you just, the sky, I mean, there's no, they can't do no wrong. That's right. Then, Smell her when she go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> then something happens and then, you know, you have to, you, you learn about each other and that boiling point that you were once where you were on fire, it comes to a simmer because you know each other, but you're still in love. You still have that relationship because you know about each other. You're constantly learning. It's the same thing with the most high. We, we read his word. We keep that word in us. That word will keep that fire going for his love, that fire of that relationship that we have to have in order to see him in peace. It's all about a relationship. You got to fan the flame. And I, that's why I say yes and no. Because if you don't fan the flame, I mean, if you do fan the flame, <clears throat> it won't be hard to keep. But if you don't fan the flame, it will be very, very, very hard to keep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Brother Mike, you have something else to add? Yeah. I, you know, I love my wife dearly. 
even though we're having our disputes. But, you know, the, my first love these days is God and God alone. Mm -hmm. Even if she wanted to leave me, I, I don't care. I, I got God. That's, that's the, who I love the most. Mm. And, you know, that's something I decided this time around, you know, nobody's going to pull me away from God. Yes, sir. But I, I had to learn this in the late age. So that's why I said my answer is no. My first love is God and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to speak to that when I, when everybody's done just a little bit. Thank you, Mike. Sister uh, Veronica. Yes, Pastor. I'm just agreeing with what everyone is saying. I'm just adding to it. When I just first came to the Lord, I didn't even know um, you know, my life before that, my BC life is like, you know, I never even thought that I would really give my my life to Christ. It wasn't even, you know, I wasn't on that path. But when I first did, I'm telling you, Pastor, it was like a different, different, totally different side of the, the road. You know what I mean? I was living this life. I transformed over to another life. So it's just just totally different transformation and i keep saying to the lord where were you all this time where were you all this time i keep saying oh, you know because i keep saying if i had known you all this time these things would have happened i wouldn't have made these bad choices and all of that but i just want to say when you love the lord and um as sister gladys said and you read the word the word transform you and when the word transform, you have that relationship with God. You will see people through God's eyes. You know, when uh, when I just started in the church and people behave in a certain way, I kind of understand because Jesus talks about it. You see it back in biblical days. You see how people act and how they carry it, and you have a sense of that. But you have to, to, to read the word, stay in the word, and stay connected to your first love and your true love. I always tell my husband, I got, I got seven men in my life, my yeah. grandchildren, yeah, my grandchildren, my sons and my husband. And I said, I tell my husband, Jesus, God is first in my life. You have one man above you all and it's God. And they said, okay, as long as it's God, then mm -hmm. every, everything is okay. You know, so I always say God's first, yeah. but we have to keep that relationship going. We have to read the word. We have to spend time with God and we have to have intimacy with God. So when you do that, you will understand other people because there's so many scriptures in the Bible tell you, you know, everybody's not perfect. You see that back in the church, back in those days when Paul have to address the church and all of that. But we just have to have the love and the, the fruit of the spirit along suffering to deal with people and know how to deal with people through God's eyes, you know? Right. right. Good job. Good job. And I, I love the way that you did not Put your pastor in there, please. please. I keep telling people, don't take that home with you. Always say, I got my three boys, my grandson, and my husband, <laughs> and Jesus. Right. You did that just right. I appreciate that. I don't be getting me beat up. Okay, I love my pastor too, and I love all my church brother, but I leave them separately. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hey, Amen. I like the way you did that. So, um, Let's let's talk about this for a second. I'll deal with the one that nobody mentioned. Um, you know, we talk about what we begin to see in the church, and uh, that is absolutely true. But I don't think anybody said what often happens is I begin to understand how truly weak I am. You know, when I first come into the church, I absolutely believe what I'm saying. Lord, now that I have you, I will never leave you, I'm talking to the Lord, or forsake you. <laughs> and then as we go along, we find out that this is a marathon, not a sprint. It would be wonderful if I we were able to just sprint to the finish line. However, that's not reality. We're going to be wounded, and sometimes those wounds are self-inflicted. And because we have self-inflicted wounds and our failures mess with our confidence, we tend to project our pain onto other people. This is also a reason 
why church members rub each other the wrong way. Because I didn't leave my pain at home. I didn't leave my frustration with myself at home. I didn't leave my, they, they have a term for it. I said I was going to remember it and I forgot it. Uh, it's, it's the, the gist of it is uh, people often experience it when they get a job they never thought they could get. They, it's, it's called the imposter syndrome. I certainly went through that when I became a pastor. You know, the imposter syndrome is, wow, you know, I, I better be quiet because all these wonderful people in this room may figure out that I'm not as good as them. I, I'm, I don't deserve to be here. That imposter syndrome can happen too when we fall into sin after we become Christians. We can begin to feel like imposters uh, because we forgot that we were not saved by our works. We were saved by the grace of God. And when people are going through imposter syndrome, guess what they see all around them? Imposters, you see? So that's another aspect of it. And we have more to do. Brother Parker, I want you to come on back and, uh, and let's see if we can get through this tonight. Here is the real evidence of overcoming. To withstand the devil's temptation to give up our faith in justification. He seeks to weaken our faith by two covert methods. Satan tries to convince us that we are too bad to be saved and that we are too good to be lost. If people believe he's a lie, they will abandon their total dependence on Christ's justification power. It is what the Bible calls the sin of unbelief. Hebrews 4 and 11. Did y'all hear how deep that was? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's Satan's method. He don't care which one you choose. I'm too bad to be saved or I'm too good to be lost. And if you listen closely, people will tell you this. We often hear it from other people from other church persuasion. They say, certainly, uh, a, you know, a God that good wouldn't just send me to hell. Why would he do that? You know, or we hear the other other end of the thing. Well, I, that the church thing is for you, you know, and I understand that you were built for that, but I'm just built a different way. And I'm just, that's just not my thing. You see, both of those positions are there. The first one that, that, that says, surely a good God wouldn't just send people to hell. I'm too good to be, I mean, I, I, I'm not a horrible person. I may not go to church. I may not read the Bible. But I, you know, I'm kind to my family. I do good by my neighbors. I'm too good to be lost. And the other one is I'm not built that way to follow Christ like that. That's your thing. You were, but please respect the fact that I'm not. I'm too bad to be saved. Both of them are there. And the bulk of the rest of our time, because this is important. This is what we, we walk amongst each other. We're walking amongst one or both of these thought processes among the brothers mm -hmm. and sisters. And we need to route this out and give God the glory that he deserves. So, so let's talk about it. What are your thoughts on too bad to be saved or too good to be lost? Uh, nobody gonna confess? Okay, I'm gonna help you no. out. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, as I was listening to everybody today, I was thinking, I don't fit in here anywhere. Mm. There's never a time when I just met Christ. I've all, mm. It seems like to me, I've always known him. When mm. we were little kids, my mother used to talk to us about Jesus and I think I thought of Jesus as one of her friends. Now, when I was really little, and she would say, if you don't be good, you're not going to get anything for Christmas because Santa Claus see everything you doing mm -hmm. and hear everything. And I used to mix Jesus and Santa Claus up. I didn't know, are they both watching me and stuff? <laughs> but as I got maybe around seven or eight years old, and we weren't at the, I wasn't, my mother wasn't in the Adventist church, but she leaned on him so heavily. 
And I told you, my mother died when I was about 12. She went in the hospital when I was about eight. And her sister, my aunt, Sister Toomes, so who you all know, took us four kids and she prayed the same way. When we would be praying, she would be praying, she'd just be turning her heart out to God. And I always think of God as being my friend. I don't go to church, think when I go in there, oh, look at all these angels. I have never thought that in my life. I walk in that front door of the church and I will say, Lord, please give me a blessing. Say something to that minister to give me, to help me to grow stronger. I think the worst thing we can do is constantly look at other people and blame other people. This is what Adam did. He blamed Eve and she blamed, she blamed the snake. And, you mm -hmm. know, everybody likes to blame. It ain't, if you're lost, it ain't going to be nobody's fault but you, your own. Mm -hmm. You need to turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. You need to read the Bible and let the Holy Spirit talk to you because we're not saved in bunches like in yeah. herds. We, yeah. you need a, I feel, I, I, I have an individual, I ask Jesus about everything. When I go to the store, Lord, help me that I don't pick up all that chocolate ice cream and cookies. And <laughs> me too, Sister Willow. You know, <laughs> be with me. Help me to be what you want me to be. Help me to be the best mother, not the best grandchild, you know, grandmother that I could be. You got to pray for your sin, for yourself and your posterity and stop looking at the people in the church. I remember Sister Bond, who was a Bible work over at Glenville, said many are going to be lost looking at the mistakes of others. Don't look Very at true. other people. And one time Jesus said, so what? What does he do? What does it? In other words, why do you care? I don't think Jesus want us to be pointing at each other. And he said, the one that don't have sin, throw the first stone. I think we get discouraged in life because we expect too much of other people. And everybody you see was born in sin. I'm going to get off my pulpit and let turn it back uh, on. Oh, you did great. You did great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sister Audrey. And then Brother Mike. Go ahead, Barbara. Hey, Barbara Brooks, Pastor. Hey, Sister Brooks. <laughs> I, you know, as I hear the different ones uh, speak, I just think about um, how different our, our associations with different members of the church can have a bearing on how we look at others. But I just um, think of no matter what you do, no matter how you think, no matter how you feel, no matter what you say, nothing supersedes the Bible. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's not anything that occurs in your life that you mm -hmm. can't pick up the Bible and read. And it will, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And mm -hmm. it will guide you. It will ch chasten you when you need chastening. And so the more you read scripture and the more you pray, then you won't be so judgmental of of our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. We just you will realize that we're all in this struggle together. Right. But what the difference is that Christ promised to hold us in the hollow of his hand. Mm -hmm. And he does just that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, <laughs> Brother Mike. You know, I was sitting there listening to that, and, you know, at one time I thought I was too bad to be saved, and I actually talked to you about it, and mm -hmm. I come to understand, no, I'm not too bad to be saved. There's a lot of people worse than me, and they're saved. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I come to realize, no, you're not too bad to be saved or too good to be saved. We're all eligible to be saved. All we got to do is ask. Yeah. And, you know, to me, that's all we got to do is ask and step out there in faith and believe that God's going to save us. Yes, sir. That's good preaching there, Brother Mike. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, Pastor. Um, yeah, too bad to be saved. I, I've ne- that have never crossed my mind because I was so bad and I never even think about that. I was so bad to the point that um, when I was in my um, in my my life out of Christ, uh, I used to curse God when things go wrong in my life. And I keep I can remember I was sharing with my son, if things don't go my way. I know there was a God and I used to curse him. And you know, thank God for Jesus that God never ever, you know, look at me in a way like he just laugh at me and said, man, you may curse me now, but you're coming to me, you know, soon. You know, God knew that I was coming to him and he never take all those silly stuff I used to say and praise God for that. But too good to be lost, no one should ever think they're too good to be lost because Jesus already addressed that. Because there's a lot of people that he said, you know, some is going to say, didn't I do this in your name? Did I do not in your name? And he's going to say, get away from me. Works does not save us. But the love of Jesus Christ is the one that saves us. You know, and um, a lot of people, when we talk about people in the church, the church is a hospital with different floors and different levels. Some coming in uh, on the first floor, they're just learning. You have some uh, taking different steps because they're all different walks. We're at different level in our Christianity faith um, by justification and sanctification. But the problem is this. We can't be in the church for 20 years and still drinking milk. At some point, we should be eating meat. And at some point, we should be graduating from the lower level until we are striving to get so, like Paul said, we live every day and we strive for the higher calling that is in Christ Jesus. So there is a problem there. You're not going to pick with people, but you can see that, you know, and obviously it's it has to do with the heart. The heart is not converted yet because when you know Christ and you, I'm not talking about know of Christ, when you really know Christ and have a personal relationship that's supposed to circumcise your heart each day. And then things should be sanctified and dropped off as you go. As you grow and as you go, things are supposed to be falling off. That's my intake. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, we're going to move on, but I want you to think about the picture on the screen for those on the phone. It is a picture of Jesus in a deep embrace with a young man who's obviously been through something and the young man is holding Jesus as tight as he can but also Jesus is holding him as tight as he can the young man is full of emotion but guess what so is this representation of Jesus and and some of these um, sentiments that we have about inadequacy or overconfidence is our insecurity about God's position. We must never forget that he wants to save us. I'm just trying to let that sink in. He wants to save us. The only thing standing in a way of being saved is us. And we can be put in these positions Uh, such as I'll use myself as an example. I'm supposed to be somebody who has answers. I'm supposed to lead by example. That is a good thing because it puts pressure on me to walk a straight line. But it can also be a bad thing because I could develop the attitude where I try to cover up my faults instead of allow God to work on them. You know, you, you try to sweep it under the rug or, 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 or try to act like, well, you know, wait a minute, I, I thought I was wrong, but I'm usually right, you know, that type of thing. And uh, because of the position that I'm in, and many of you are in that position in your family. You are one or one of the few 
who are actually trying to follow Christ and you know people are watching you very closely. And just like me, the temptation to be too proud, to try to, to walk by your merits instead of walk by faith is a real temptation. And it also can cause us to look down on people and it can also create some frustration that is unnecessary when we remember that Jesus took all that into account and still said, I love you enough to die for you. We've shown people how to be, how to perform, how to be the, the picture perfect Christian and walk on into the kingdom. But why don't we try showing people how to be wounded and stumble into the kingdom? That might be a little bit more impactful than trying to show them something that they don't think they can achieve. Right. Amen. Just food for thought. And here's uh, a biblical example of that. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Two men, both in church to pray, two different attitudes and two different verdicts. Luke 18, nine through 14. And notice I'm still, I'm sticking here because remember, remember how I started tonight. The source of our issue is a communication problem. Either we have misunderstood something or something God is trying to say has not yet reached us and impacted us the way that God is trying to unlock all of these chains that we put around ourselves. So, so let's take a, a look at it real quick. Uh, Brother uh, Parker, you still there? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. And he spake this parable unto certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Mm. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Brother Parker, how did he go down to his house? He went down to his house justified. Lord have mercy. So the man who admitted that he was a sinner went home justified, meaning cleansed by the yes. blood of the Lamb. I got a question for everyone. You had a, a comment about that, Brother Parker? You, you certainly can go ahead if you like. When, the, when I first read this passage years ago, I thought about how we, me, sometimes go to God, not thinking that we're being proud and boastful, but that we have done good during that week or whatever, or that day. And we tell God what we have done, which God already knows. But we need to be as the publican was. No matter how good we are, we are still nothing but a sinner hmm. saved by grace. Yes, indeed. Well said, Brother Parker. All right. Um, can I get in a minute? Yes, ma'am. You know, I ma just want to say, I think both of these men were very judgmental. The one was judging himself as being good because of the outward things he did. I'm trying to work my way to heaven. I'm paying double tithe and I'm wearing, making my wife wear long dresses and no makeup. <laughs> and, 
you know, and, and I don't eat no meat. You know, <laughs> this is the way he he judging himself. The other man looked, you know, he he looked down on himself, and he thinks the other man is good too. Like I said before, we got to turn our eyes on Jesus and not look at other people. Because some people think that people that are really quiet and stuff and mousy, you know, those are the really good godly people. Don't worry about nobody else. You got to look to yourself and do what, you know, I got a call this week uh, from my son. And, you know, he left home early, went away to school, came home for a little while, and he's been living in that D.C. area for almost 40 years. And he called me to ask, and I said, what are you calling me for? Are you trying to ask me what should you do? He said, yes, that's the way I want to live. I want to live in such a way that when my children have problems, that they know I'm somebody who got a relationship with God and I'm there for my children. And you know what? Okay, I don't, but I see these two men both, neither one of them, they both judging each other and judging themselves when Jesus only is the judge. And I think each one of us to just try to be what God wants us to be. I'm a grandmother, a great grandmother, and I just want to live in such a way. I want to be able to say like Paul, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, and I know that there's a crown laid up for me. Not that I think it, it don't have nothing to do with how much money I put in the church or how I dress or what I eat. It's because Jesus is my friend. We talk every day. You need to have Jesus as your friend. He needs to be there when you take a shower, when you get up. When you go to bed at night, not just when you, you know, you're scared. He needs to be your friend all the time. And we need to be longing to get to heaven to see Jesus, you know. And and don't worry about anything. I think we think too much about what other people do. Think about that Jesus see what we do. And I'm going to try to get off this phone. This all right. Phone. All right. Well, I have a question for you, Sister, Sister Whitlock. Go ahead. Um, if I, I agree with you on the Pharisee, he he judged the good point. I'm gonna use that in my sermons. He judged the publican, the tax collector, and he judged himself. But I'm not sure about the, the the tax collector because the Bible says he went home justified, that he was forgiven. So if he if he was wrong, if the tax collector was wrong. How did he get forgiven before he left the church? Because he was justified because he knew he had done something wrong. He also saw this uh, the, the Pharisee as a righteous man. We sit in church and we see certain people. And as a child or as a young person, I thought some people was really good. And then this minister took somebody else's wife. And then I'm disappointed. And I learned you know, people come and go, you can't really, you don't know, no, you can look at the outer appearance. God looks at the heart. And I've, I've gotten to the place where I really don't care what people think about me. It's what does God think about me? The other man was justified because when you know you're a sinner, you can ask to be clean. But when you think your face is clean, you're not going to wash it. All right. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see anywhere in this text where the tax collector was uh, referring to the Pharisee at all. Uh, you I, know, he... he they, I, were, they were standing right together. They could see each other. And the, because he was a tax collector, he felt, I'm a sinner. Sometimes poor people think they're more... They're sinners and people with a lot of money who live in the suburbs are somebody to be looked up to. Okay, that's the okay. way I've okay. always saw this. All right, well, I thought he was saying he was a sinner because he was a sinner, right, but we'll move on. <laughs> We'll go on to the next thing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sister Sister Betty. Uh, so so here you see I got a picture. Um, I know that some I apologize for some of you can't see. I got a close-up now 
of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I have a question for you. Uh, have you been one or both of these at any time in your Christian experience? Yes, I have. Who is that? Come on, tell us about it. Oh, you're going quiet on me now. <laughs> All right. Any, anyone else? I'll, I'll say I'm, I've always been a sinner. Okay. All right. Well, this, I, this just, I should like, And here. I'm just going to say, I've always been a sinner. I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's why I'm going to stick with my friend so he can yoke up with me because I can't do it by myself. That's it. Amen. Amen. And pastor, I'm going to say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, well, I guess I should restate my question. I'm really more so talking about the attitude. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have we been uh, seduced into one or both of these? I mean, we are not always in the same mood all the time, right? Uh, there are times where uh, I'm sure like me, that some of you just gratefulness just overwhelms you. It just comes out of nowhere and you feel grateful for what God has done. And there are other times when you feel like Moses, you're trying and trying to give the Lord your best, but, but when you're trying to work with other people, it can be difficult. So, I mean, I'm trying to have an honest conversation. Go ahead, Elder Hood, go ahead. Sister Hood, go ahead. Yes, I, I, I was just going to kind of say what you said in that, um, yes, and that is why I am still in the process of being sanctified, because if it was not for the grace of God today, it could be me, or it could be you, and tomorrow, it could be me, and That's so right. when, because I am as Mother Whitlock said, born in sin and shaping in iniquity, I have the propensity, even though I am in the, pro even though I love God, even though I serve God, even though I know who he is, even though I have a relationship with him, even though I, he used me to, to be a blessing to other people, even though I've experienced knowing how to ride, what it, when the text rides on the high places in the earth, even though I have had those those uh mountaintop experiences with god there have been times when yes i have come up short and there goes i and why because i am still that work in process progress and sometimes i have a tendency at times there have been times even even uh not too long ago there are times when I still come up short, you know, that I may say something that I should not say. That Moses thing, that's what I'm saying. You know, so the bottom line <laughs> is, it doesn't folks. take away my love and my desire to want to be like Christ and to strive. Mm -hmm. Because when I sin, does he say, I keep sinning, God forbid. However, I recognize that I am. And I repent because he says, if I confess my sins, now it's not a matter of, oh, I'm being presumptuous of his goodness. I recognize that I am still flawed. And at any moment, if I am not aware, because self-awareness is so important. It, right. When I lose sight of who I am, then yeah, I am subject to come up short. And so, yes, Pastor Hood, um, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much. Well said, Brother Mike. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, in a way, I guess I can say I'm like the Pharisee as well, especially when I'm driving. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel I'm the best driver. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Good one, Mike. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, Pastor. Pastor this sorry. is Mother Watts. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. This, this yeah. is Mother Watts. Sister Hood and I are, still, are sharing the same banner. The work in process banner over my head, mm -hmm. I was going to say the same thing. But yeah, I just asked the Lord, don't give up on me yet. Yes. I'm still 
with you, Father. That banner has been over my head constantly, and I don't forget from where he brought me from, from darkness into the marvelous light, because I was on my way to hell and stopped. You know, there wasn't a bigger Lexus or a Mercedes that was going to get me there fancier. But mm-hmm. the Lord saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And right. I'm so glad he's God all by himself and that he never changes, never changes. So he still has patience. And it took patience to deal with me because I was like baby's key. Where did <laughs> you come from? Where did you come from? And Lord. if he wasn't God, he would be shaking his head and say, oh, I got my hands full with this one here. Mm-hmm. I got my hands full, but by him being God, <laughs> he's majestic and omnipotent. And all power is in his hands. And it took all that power for me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I thank him. I thank Amen. him. Amen. So let's let's go, Sister Audrey and Sister Veronica. Go ahead, Barb. It's Barbara Brooks again, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. And I still go back to God's word because uh, we're talking about uh, we are sinners. Yes, we are sinners. We were born in sin and shapen and iniquity. But we, the scripture goes on to tell us when Christ comes again, we'll be changed. Mm-hmm. So as we sojourn on this earth or sleep in the grave until he comes, we'll still be sinners. The only thing is, as we accept Christ as our Savior, we are sinners saved by grace. And when he comes again, we gather up people, we will be changed. And the okay. Bible says, and a quick way of an eye. Mm-hmm. So my question is, believe us about this. Amen. Amen. All right. Mic drop there. Sister Veronica, go ahead. Um, I'll pass. Basically, um, Elder um, Hood, Sister Hood, cover it, and Sister um, Watts was saying basically what I was. Oh, okay. No problem. Brother Parker, and then Sister Hood. Oh, never mind. I agree with what everyone was saying, simply because none of us can actually say, if we're being transparent, that we have not thought that we were better than somebody else. Come on, Brother Parker. Come on and shame the devil. Yes, sir. (laughs) Because all of us in our life, even as a Christian, have seen somebody do something and said, I would never do that. Mm -hmm. And then turn around probably do something worse but we thought we were better than the other person mm-hmm. I remember myself when I first went to church, I had no intention I'm going to say that again no intention of giving my life to God mm-hmm. none hadn't even thought about it <clears throat> hadn't entered my mind but then after I got saved I looked back and I saw where God started cleaning me up before he even brought me to the church to save me. Because he knew better than I did that if he did not clean me up before I went in there, I would not do it. Say it. None of us can, can save ourselves. Every one of us need Christ in our life. Every single day, Amen. every single hour, every single minute. Mm-hmm. Because thoughts come into our mind. And we don't know where they came. We don't know how they entered that mind because at the time we weren't even thinking about it. Somebody say something to us and we say in our mind, if I wasn't saved, I'd cuss you out. Oh. But now, wait a minute. That, that thought shouldn't even be in your mind to cuss somebody out. Right. Because you're not the person you used to be. So none of us, not any one of us on this line can say I am better than anybody else and I would never do anything wrong because the Bible lets us know every thought we have is going to be judged. Mm-hmm. All right, I can end the service on that one. Uh, Elder Hoods, you got your hand raised again? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I got you. I got you. All right. So the truth of the matter is, 
is that to de deny that we've never been the Pharisee is to deny our humanity. It is basic human nature to identify ourselves compared to other people. Now, unless you've been translated and you've been to the mountaintop and God just blessing us with your presence, we all compare ourselves to other people because it gives us a sense of where we stand. Everybody does that. The difference is when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and the Holy Spirit begins to convict us, we can easily wash away that Pharisee thought and get to the place where the publican is. If you look at the patriarchs and prophets, uh, specifically I'm thinking of Isaiah now, he begins the first five chapters of his book like the Pharisee. And yet God brings him into vision and takes a coal from the altar and now he's the publican. We all, what, what this visual is telling us, and I'm sorry for those who are on the phone and can't see it, is that we all need to be saved and that God actually wants to save us. I'm gonna keep saying it. We don't have to compete for salvation. It's ours. Does everybody understand that? We don't need to try to outdo anybody for salvation. All we have to do is accept it. And, uh, and we're gonna end it by bringing this point all the way home. And I'm not really coming up with these concepts. It's coming right out of the book. One day we're gonna get our book. One day in the name of Jesus, we all gonna get a book. But uh, Brother Parker, uh, let's, uh, we're gonna close the comments on this part. And Brother Parker, let's, uh, let's go ahead and finish. There's only two slides left. And then we're gonna close it out. In fact, the sin of unbelief is the sin against the Holy Spirit that has no forgiveness. Mercy. Not because God arbitrarily chooses not to forgive, but because we choose not to believe we are too bad to be saved. Then we doubt Christ's ability to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Hebrews 7.25. Or if we conclude that we are too good to be lost, then we qualify as Laodiceans. Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me let me add something to this, another perspective to it. The Pharisee in the story's biggest sin was not that he believed he could be saved. It was believing that the publican couldn't be. Oh, come on in here now. Come on. Mercy. <laughs> Let's talk about it. That's where he gave himself away. There was nothing wrong with him fasting twice a week. There was nothing wrong with him returning his tithe or keeping the Sabbath holy or keeping the diet. There was nothing wrong with those statements where he gave his heart away is he did not believe that God could say to the uttermost, the lowest person. If we are a disciple of Christ, we are the lesser light. In other words, we are striving to think his thoughts and do what he would do, to love what he love and hate what he hate. And if we are really in Christ, it would be impossible for us to believe that somebody is beyond his reach. That is the problem with looking down on your brother and sister. It's not that you are not right about how bad they are, but you're wrong about how good God is. God is better than their bad. Ah, oh, yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. It's the sin of unbelief. It's the unbelief is not that God isn't God. It's not that God uh, will not save me. That's not the unbelief that's the worst. The worst kind is after God has pulled me out of the sludge and the mud that he closed the door. Wow. That's when we're telling on ourselves. It's a sure sign of unconversion when we look at others and shake our heads and think they're too far gone. How are we gonna pray after that? What exactly are we gonna pray about? We've already declared ourselves judge, jury, and executioner 
you're God. What you need a God for? You've decided that you are God. That was the Pharisee's worst sin. Mm -hmm. Is he put himself in God's place. He made himself the judge. Therefore, it was his decision whether somebody could be redeemed or not. You see how there's no forgiveness for it? Because there's no room for forgiveness with that kind of arrogance. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, Donna raised her hand. Go ahead, Donna. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Well, I think that um, that is why it is so important before, um, you know, when we look at others around us to first of all, try to put yourself in their shoes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that is what, you know, will allow you to better understand, you know, what's going on with them or why they're doing what they're doing. But more importantly, to see that it's also possible that you could do it too. In other words, there but for the grace of God go I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add to what you're saying, my proof of what God can do is because he did it for me. Now, if I'm thinking I did it myself, then I can say, you can't do it or you can't have that grace because it's merit-based. But if I know in my heart of hearts and I remember where God brought me from, then there's no way that I wouldn't be shouting it from the mountaintop that I'm a beggar who found bread and let me show you where the bread is. Amen. I think we'll have church then, right? We'll really have church. <laughs> All yes. right. All right, Brother Parker. Let's bring it all home. Uh, clean yourself up properly. Floss your teeth properly. Clean your face properly. Clean your armpits properly. Clean your pubic area properly. Well, somebody taking a bath. Let me. Let me <laughs> you guys. This is very detailed instructions. <laughs> all, right. all right. Go ahead, Brother Parker. They place their trust in their own goodness, in their ability to perform certain religious duties, in what is taking place within them, and not in what the Savior did in their behalf on Calvary. Amen. Um, basically, what we all just talked about. Right. This is what we've been discussing. They place their trust in their own goodness. That's why we tell on ourselves, you know, like Jesus said, we ought to do what to one another? We ought to love one another. What's the golden rule? Do unto others. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. See what I've been yeah. This is the evidence that, that uh, we are in Christ, that we love one another all right all right i know some tootie snooties might be offended by that but hey it is what it is let's let's get right now let's get right the sin of unbelief i was gonna have a discussion on this but i think we we chewed up all the time <laughs> the sin of unbelief i would just say let's not be guilty of that and if if we have a struggle with that let's be honest with god god help me I, I, I'm on autopilot. It's, it's, it's not even, I don't have to think about it. I just automatically judge and condemn. Lord, help me to stop doing that. Take that out of me because I know that's not like you. How can I, remember we talked one, one Wednesday about the, the guy who was forgiven, the, the king forgave him, and then he went out and jacked up somebody who owed him a little bit. Remember we talked about that? Mm -hmm. that, that's what this is. You know, we, 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 we are looking to be forgiven, but at the same time refusing to be forgiving. Now, how are we going to do that? You know, we got to choose one or the other, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and being forgiving is, uh, is the evidence that we appreciate the fact that we have been forgiven. Yo. Pastor, I have a question for you. There was a part in the Bible that um, someone came to Jesus and he said that, um, I believe, help my unbelief. Yes. 
And, yeah. you know, so he was kind of praying that, you know, God will help him to believe, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's the man crying on the side of the road. Of the road, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we all should have that as a part of our prayer, you know, because uh, none of us are perfect. None of us have everything locked down. We all have weaknesses. We all have pet peeves. We have things that bother us more than, than other things. I talked about mine openly. I have continued to struggle as a pastor uh, when someone has done something, uh, sexually assaulted a child. There's an anger, a rage that, that comes up in me. And, uh, and I know I can't properly minister in that state. And that's an ongoing battle for me. I handle it better now than I did in the beginning but I, but that applies too. It doesn't matter how bad we hate the sins. We, the, the principle still applies that God's power, God's ability to redeem and forgive goes as deep as it needs to go. Okay. Uh, you know, traditionally the church has, uh, has been, boy, I tell you, we've been hard on people who've been divorced and don't do it twice. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So we won't even let you stand at the door and pretend you are strength, you know? <laughs> you know, just giving an example of how we can be prejudiced towards certain things and, uh, and not mindful that we're not the savior, that he holds that position all by himself. And uh, so, so there's something certainly to to pray about and, and think about the different aspects that I gave you on the sin of unbelief. It's not just a matter of whether or not you believe God will save you. It also applies to believing whether or not God can forgive and save others. All right, last one, Brother Parker, and we're closing it out. Such experiences can never lead us to have Christ formed within by faith. See Galatians 4.19. Instead, they will lead us to a form of godliness through outward behavior, but denying the power thereof, the power of Christ to justify us by his life and death. 2 Timothy 3 and 5. Scripture counsels us to turn away from such an experience. Well, there you have it. There you have it. That is that is it. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I thought that was the last one. <laughs> My, bad. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. <laughs> we need to instead follow Abraham's example. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that we, he, God, had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. All right, so think about that. Abraham had not been to Sabbath school. He had not had Bible studies, but the impression of the Holy Spirit on him, he did not stagger. He was fully persuaded, fully persuaded, and this is what we need to be. Uh, you know, I, this is indeed the last thing. Until Jesus Christ is the obsession of your heart, you'll always be looking to mere men to meet needs that only he can fill. When you make Jesus Christ your first love, will, uh, will you be ready for a love story? Will you be ready for a love story that reflects his glory? Indeed, indeed, that is it for tonight. Thank you all so much for participating. And uh, I said it wasn't gonna be a marathon. It turned into one anyway. I'm glad that almost all of you stuck around. I hope that it blessed you in some kind of way. Uh, I look forward to worshiping with you again on Friday night. I'll be on my way back. I'll be in the air, so I won't be in Sabbath school, but I will be with you on uh, Sabbath morning for our worship hour at noon. All right, if everybody's clear, I think we can close with prayer, okay? All right, Lord, thank you for uh, 
just a sobering message tonight. It really makes us look at uh, how we are dealing with one another. And uh, Lord, we look forward to the day when you come through the clouds and sin won't be an issue. But until then, then Lord, help us to navigate these obstacles and keep us ever mindful that you are uh, looking for ways to heal us, to redeem us, to forgive us, that you are not against us, that you are for us. And Lord, we pray that even when we need it the most, that you comfort us with these words. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone.